Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. Where our founder and preaching pastor is Bishop Joey Johnson and our first lady is Pastor Kathy Johnson. And what better way for them to go ahead and continue the celebration of 48 years of faithful ministry than for them to go from Founders Day to vacation. Amen. Amen. We praise God that they are able to get away and get some rest and relaxation. Uh, my name is Pastor Darren and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor and the privilege of preaching today. So I just want to welcome you into our service on this morning. I believe that God has given me a word that will speak to your situation and your circumstances. If you are viewing us online on Facebook, on YouTube, I invite you to share this service. Let somebody know that there is a word in the house. With so much going on in this country, in our homes, we need a word from the Lord. So let's prepare ourselves to receive that word as the praise team comes and sets the atmosphere.
Heavenly Father, we, we already feel your presence in this place. So Lord, I just ask that you would have your way. Have your way in this service. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our homes. Have your way in our place of work. Lord, we surrender all to you at this moment. Lord, we need a touch. We need a word from you. Something to help us get through what we are going through. Heavenly Father, I just ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight that I would be able to pour out in public what you have poured into me in private. Lord, whatever happens in and through this service, I just ask that we would leave here a little different than the way we came in. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, to give you the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In a collection of essays entitled How Life Imitates the World Series, the author Dave Boswell tells a story about a man named Earl Weaver. Now, now Earl Weaver was the manager of the Baltimore Orioles, and many sports fans or baseball fans like this story because it shows how he handled the baseball star Reggie Jackson. Now, now, Reggie Jackson had personality to spare. Reggie Jackson is a Hall of Fame baseball player. In fact, he had earned the nickname Mr. October because of his performance during the World Series. Now, now Weaver had a rule that, that no player could steal a base unless they were giving the signal or the instruction to steal a base. Now this upset Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson felt that he had earned the right to make this decision for himself. He felt that he knew the pitchers and the catchers well enough that when he decided to steal a base, that was the right time. So, so there was a particular game where Reggie Jackson was like, you know what, I'm not worried about Earl. I'm not worried about Weaver, I'm not worried about his signs. When I get on base, I'm gonna do what I feel is the right thing to do. So Reggie Jackson got on first base and he decided to steal second base without being instructed to do so. He got a good jump on the pitcher and he got out and he slid in the second base and he beat the throw and he made it there safely. Of course, Reggie Jackson, he stood up with his chest poked out and he dusted his uniform off and he thought that he had proved his point and his expertise to his manager. Now his manager later on, Mr. Weaver, he pulled Jackson aside and began to explain why he had not given him the instruction to steal second base. See, he told him that, that once he moved to second base, that then left first base open. And there was a power hitter coming behind him, and he was wanting the power hitter to get a hit to get himself and Reggie Jackson home. But, but since Reggie Jackson got ahead of himself and went to second base, now the team could walk the next batter and put him on first base. And then the batter come behind him, he struggled with the pitcher, so the, so the manager had to call in a sub when he didn't want to. He wanted to save that substitution for later on in the game and see what well, well, he was trying to show Reggie was that Reggie understood a, a small piece of the perspective. Reggie understood his relationship with the pitcher and he understand his relationship with the catcher, but, but his manager was managing the whole game. See, this is often how we interact with our relationship with the Lord. We only see so far. The truth of the matter is we, we think we see farther than we really do, but, but God sees the big picture. God is managing the whole game. And therefore, when God gives us an instruction when God sends us a signal. It is wise that no matter what we think we know, we do what God is calling us to do. Here's the reason why I'm telling this story. I believe, I believe and I sense that, that, that God is 
sending us a signal. I believe that God is sending us a signal as it relates to the season that we are in, and therefore we need to pay careful attention that we obey what God is revealing. Because how we handle this season will impact how we are able to handle the next season. Go with me to a familiar parable found in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter 6, we'll be looking at verse 46 down to verse 49. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 down to verse 49. And here begins the reading of God's word. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. To set the context for this morning's preaching and teaching, I would like to tag this text with the thought, it's building season. It's building season. I ask your neighbor, are you building or what? Uh, the, 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 let, me, let me do some work with the context as we work our way into this passage. The gospel, according to Luke, was written during the first century in modern-day Palestine. This text is situated within the first century Israel where they were living under Roman occupation and were looking for the day when the promised king from the lineage of David would bring justice, peace, and prosperity to the whole world. Uh, there is a saying that says the same thing that makes you laugh makes you cry. And that proved itself to be true in the life of Jesus because the very things that drew people to Jesus was the very things that later on in his life caused him to yell, crucify him at his crucifixion. Uh, Jesus is what we would call a metaphorical theologian, which took the traditional Hebrew teachings and reframed them in a new metaphorical landscape. See, see, metaphor is important because that is how we think and that is how we reason and how we continually make sense out of this constantly changing world that we live in. We have to, to use something that we know to help us un understand what we don't know. See, essentially, Jesus is providing them a new way of living, a new way of thinking and feeling. And herein is why the parables of Jesus often uh, uh, are, are considered to be literary and poetic works of art because they are fashioned out of the raw materials of life and they include things that we can all relate to. This, in fact, is what gives parables their timeless nature. And furthermore, the audience of parables, they were invited to identify with the parable. They were invited to place themselves within the story, within the landscape of the story. Herein is why parables often are left open-ended. Most parables of Jesus really don't have an ending because he is inviting the audience to put themselves in the story and how they respond to the story is how the story ends for them. In Luke chapter 6, the ministry of Jesus is in its inaugural phase. In fact, in verses 1 to 11, Jesus is chastised by the religious leaders for allowing his disciples to eat grain on the Sabbath. And if that wasn't enough, he is further chastised by them because he also healed on the Sabbath. Going to verse 12 and 19, Jesus then goes up onto a mountain and spends all night in prayer. He then comes down from the mountain, appoints 12 disciples, and begins his foundational teaching on the hallmarks of discipleship. 
Uh, the Bible tells us that a large crowd surrounded Jesus, including disciples and people from Judea and Jerusalem, Tyre and Sidon. They came near and they heard him. And the Bible says that they were healed of their diseases. Now, now, Luke puts a unique spin on this because Luke tells us that he is turning his gaze from the crowd and begins looking at his disciples. And in other words, there may be a lot of people surrounding Jesus, but this message wasn't for everybody. It might help everybody, but it wasn't direct at the crowd. It was only directed at the disciples of Jesus. Luke is emphasizing that this, this, this parable has a very specific audience. And what follows is what Luke's account of what Matthew calls the Sermon on the Mount. However, in Luke's gospel, it is called the Sermon on the Plain. Either way, it is Jesus' foundational teaching on discipleship and what it means to live as a member in the kingdom of God here on earth as he laid out this message. Jesus is doing this because he wants his disciples to, to begin to understand him more. He wants his disciples to approach him with an open heart and approach him with open ears and not always approach him with an open hand. In this traditional passage, the disciples are invited from the fringes into a more personal relationship with Jesus. In fact, Jesus is opening himself up to a personal and private ministry relationship with his disciples. And herein is why this passage opens with the question, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I'm telling you to do? See, essentially, the ministry of Jesus was both challenging them, but it was also inviting them to a new way of life. Let me, let me tie up some loose ends and pull this all together before we come forward. Jesus' actions on the Sabbath, Jesus picking the 12 disciples, Jesus teaching them the fundamental kingdom principles, the audience surrounding Jesus, that, that as he gave this teaching, Jesus is essentially telling them that a new season has arrived with new opportunities for blessings, but it will require new demands to be met. And in other words, Jesus Jesus is telling them it's building season. As we move from the peripheral matters to the more practical implications of the text, I, I need you to understand first and foremost that building season in Palestine only takes place in the summer. In the summer is the only time when you would build a house in Palestine. See, the summer provides dry, warm days suitable with conditions for building a house. But, but there's also a downside to this. The downside we find in Leviticus where it says that the clay content of the ground was like bronze meaning that it was very difficult to, to dig during the summer, but the summer was when you were supposed to build. Isn't this a lot like life? The season when building should be done is the season that is most challenging. Isn't it interesting how, how the, the, when it's the time to do something, when God calls us to do something, he doesn't remove the challenges. In fact, that is often when it is the most challenging to do it. This shows us that the, the, the presence of challenges doesn't automatically mean that the season is incorrect, but we must understand that to build effectively, the builder must learn to dig through the clay until he hits the rock. You must keep digging. It, I know it's hard. I know it's tough, but you must keep digging. Whether it's one inch, whether it's 10 feet, you got to keep digging because building must be done on the rock. There, there is no shortcutting this process. The builder must put in back-breaking work until he hits the rock. This implies preparation prep work, if you will, the, the, the work that appears to be slowing you down when, when you compare your progress to other people, that's 
the work you should be doing. The work that looks like it's not advancing you towards your goal is often the work that is vital to do. We must be willing to dig before we build. We can't just show up and start building. We got to be willing to dig before we build. Building season is during a desert Middle Eastern summer without a cloud in the sky. Despite the challenges, the wise builder recognizes it's building season and begins to dig. Dig despite the fact that during the day, temperatures can often reach 95 degrees. The wise builder keeps digging with the sun beating down on them, sweat dripping from his or her face, blisters on their hands from working with the tools, their muscles aching. But we can't be afraid of work when it's building season. The person in right relationship with Jesus recognizes when it's time to build and recognizes how to build. But see, the second builder, the second builder stops short and builds their house on the clay. See, the thing about clay is this. Clay, clay is deceptive because it appears to be as hard as rock under the right circumstances. But see, the rock is hard regardless of the circumstances. See, see, clay gives the appearance of being stable when the rock really is stable. See, see, when you, when you build on clay, it, it takes less of an initial investment, but you think you're going to get the same return on that investment. See, clay makes it appealing because the builder has to use less personal sacrifice in order to build. See, the world with all of its trapping is trying to form in us a desire for clay instead of a passion that will drive us to build on the rock. There is the clay of materialism. There is the clay of consumerism. There is the clay of selfishness. There is the clay of mistrust. And if we're honest this morning, all of us at one point in time in our lives thought that the clay was a good foundation to build upon. Notice, notice how the text says that both builders heard, but only one builder acted on what they heard. Both builders had the knowledge, but only one had the wisdom to new use that knowledge correctly. We live in an age of knowledge. We live in the information age. We have all kinds of knowledge right in your cell phone. You can Google and get the answer to anything. We have all kinds of knowledge, but what we don't have is wisdom. Yeah, 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 knowledge is not in short supply, but wisdom. Wisdom is in short supply. Wisdom that you can only get from doing what God has called you to do. There's all kind of knowledge. People have knowledge in podcasts, po knowledge in apps, knowledge in social media, but not many people have wisdom. See, see, wow. They both had knowledge. The, the person building on the rock, their, their knowledge became wisdom because their knowledge moved from their head to their heart and then was manifested in their hands. That takes time. You got to sit with it a little bit. You got to live with it a little bit. It takes a little trial and error. It takes some commitment, but you got to sit with it long enough so that it moves from just something that you know that, that it becomes something that you are, and that way your doing begins to flow out of your being. The interesting point is that the homes that both builders built, outwardly, they can look the same. Outwardly, they can both look like they're used the same foundation. In fact, the house built on the clay could actually look more attractive and more stable than the house that's built on the foundation. But the thing about it is time is a great revealer. And there will come a time 
when the house that is built on the true foundation will be shown to be the house that lasts. Now, now I know this is the house of the Lord, and, 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 and y'all, y'all need a little bit more out of this parable. I, I remember when I, the, the first Wednesday I, I preached for Bishop, he told me, he said, you know, you know, Pat, you know Darren, that, that, that the house of the Lord, they, they are a good audience, but they have an expectation. They have an expectation about the, the level of content that you give them. So, so I know there's an expectation, so, so can I push this a little bit further? See, see, the words that, that Luke gives us is, in fact, Jesus is describing a specific kind of natural disaster that overwhelmed and destroyed the house. In fact, we can see that this is a specific kind of natural disaster in the words that Jesus used to describe it. Follow me here. Jesus said that the torrent burst against the house. The torrent burst against the house. Now, the torrent speaks of a natural waterway violently overflowing its, its shores and violently bursting against the house. Moreover, in, in Luke, catch this, Jesus mentions a flood but mentions no rain. But, but, but in Matthew, Matthew says rain comes, then the flood waters rose, but Luke is trying to, trying to give us a specific curve, a specific perspective on this because Jesus mentions a flood with no rain. Now, now, according to the Center for Research and Documentation, floods are the most dangerous natural disaster to impact Israel. In fact, they are, when there are when they're heavy rain miles away, the water running down in the valley can cause flash flooding, which means that you can live somewhere where there is no rain. It can rain miles away and you still get hit with a flash flood. It means that you could be looking up and there's not a cloud in the sky, yet one moment later, you could be dealing with a flash flood. See, Jesus is teaching them and Jesus is teaching us that our lives are prone to flash floods. Our lives are prone to the unexpected problems. Jesus is speaking to these unexpected issues that flood into our lives and overwhelm us in an instant. See, flash floods are the most dangerous kind of flood. Because they carry all of the force of a regular flood, but it happens rapidly. See, this is when life is coming at you so fast with so many different issues and problems that you feel like your life is out of control. This is, this is when the stress is so extreme that emotionally and cognitively you can't even function. Am I the only person in this sanctuary that knows what it's like to have so much happening in your life, so much breaking out on every side that you can't even mentally comprehend what has happened to you? You spend weeks and days in a fog, y'all. Life just happens to you. Life is so painful that it doesn't even feel real. These are the moments where the pain and stress is so intense. This is what Jesus is describing. The times when life violently hits you repeatedly and you feel like you're going to drown and there's trouble on every side. But remember, it's building season. Let, let, let's, let's push into that a little bit. Let, let's lean into building season now that we've framed this topic. See, see, here is when God began to show me something that I had never noticed before in this text. Jesus says that, that the foundation was used to build a house. Now, in the Greek, the word house in this context, it implies more than just a structure. It, it implies a home. Where, where are my seasoned saints at? See, see, this, this is, y'all remember this. Y'all remember Luther Vandross, right? This, this is where Luther was talking about that, that a room is not a house. 
And a, and a house is not a home. See, a home is where your heart is. A home is a dwelling place. A home is a place of comfort, stability, and safety. A home is where your life is built. A home is where your children are raised. A home is where your heart is. A home is where lifelong relationships are nurtured. He's talking about building a home. See, in this parable, he's giving a, a blueprint on how to lay the foundation for building a life. But, 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 but notice. Notice he doesn't give instructions on how to build the house. <laughs> but he gives instructions on how to lay the foundation. This is because the life we create is so specific to our relationship with God and it's so specific in particular to what each of us has been assigned to complete and what God has called each of us individually to do that he doesn't give instructions about the house because that's personal. He gives instructions about the foundation because that is universal. See, this is why we can't keep going on comparing what we're building with what somebody else is building. Because y'all are not working with the same blueprint. See, I, I can't be building over here and, and worry about what you're building over there. I, I can't be building over here and, and looking out the corner of my eye to see what you're building over there. I, I can't be building over here and getting on the phone and calling somebody to find out what you're building. I got to focus on what God has called me to build. Build your marriage. Build your house. Build your career. Don't worry about nobody else's spouse. Build yours. You can't compare what you're building to what somebody else is building because your blueprint is not theirs. It's building season. See, this is because in the kingdom of God, no two houses are the same. There are no cookie cutter homes in the kingdom. But in the kingdom, we all need the same foundation. Let me, let, let, me, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story, drive this point home. When, when Hurricane Ike crashed Texas with 110 mile per hour winds, it left almost nothing behind in the small coastal town of Gilcrest. It almost demolished the whole town. In fact, they, they took aerial pictures over this town that, that stretched for miles along this narrow peninsula that, that has swept almost everything away. It, it, it seemed unreal, the devastation. But when they took these aerial pictures, there was one house that was still standing. There was one house surrounded by all this destruction, surrounded by all this wasteland. There was one house. And see, nobody even believed that it was really one house left. They thought it was photoshopped. They said, how could there be one house when everything else around it had been destroyed? So, so they, 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 they found the owner of that house and, and they interviewed the owner and the homeowner said something interesting the homeowner said I I, I lost the first house <laughs> to a previous storm therefore when I had a chance to build my second house I built it strong enough to carry to withstand a category 5 windstorm and the only difference between the first house in the second house was the fortified, raised foundation that I built the second house on. See, see, I don't know about you, but life like this has been similar for me as it's been to this man in Texas. See, during my life, I've experienced building on the clay. I've experienced building on the rock. 
See, despite the knowledge I knew that I, that I had when I grew up in church, I, I still chose to build on the clay. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I, I decided to build on the clay of materialism. I, I began thinking that my self-worth was tied to the clothes and shoes that I wore. I, I started building on the clay of public opinion, and I wanted to be more accepted than to be myself and be who God had called me to be. I, I began building building on the clay of chasing fast money and fast women, thinking that more of both made me more of a man. And, and, and for a time, the, the clay appeared to do the job until the waters came rushing in. Until the waters came rushing in and everything in my life fell apart and the destruction was great. But house of the Lord, uh, this is where I get a praise down in my soul. Because just like the man in Texas, God gave me the ability to build again. God gave me the grace to build again. I thank God that he's a God of a second chance because he allowed me to build again. I know this might not be your first time building. This might not be your second time building. This might be not even be your fourth or fifth time building. But just know I can hear God telling me that for some of us today, this is your opportunity to build again. This building season, for somebody in here, we gonna build something in the house of the Lord during this season. And what we build, we're going to ensure that we're building on the rock. See, here's why. Here's why this sermon is important. Because the season will change. And what the wise builder built in one season was designed to be his shelter in the next season. So if we don't build right in this season, we won't have the shelter we need in the next season. Because the Bible says when the flood waters rose, not if, when the flood waters rose. It's, it's just a matter of time before the flood comes, but, but when it's building season and we build right and we build appropriately and we build upon the rock, what we build will be our shelter when the storm comes. See this, this is the difference that Jesus makes in our life. The difference isn't in the absence of a flood. The difference Jesus makes is how you come out of the flood. The difference is how you go through the storm, how you come out the storm, how you go through the flood, how you come out the flood. The difference is our foundation. The difference is the staying power of the rock. See, here's my main point. My main point is this is simple. Our relationship with Jesus will give us the shelter to endure next season. Your relationship with Jesus will give you the shelter you need to endure the next season. So right now, it's building season. It's building season in your ministry. Yes, the first time around, it got taken out by the flood, but God has given you the grace to build again. It's building season. It's building season in your finances. It's time to commit to giving and tithing. It's, it's time to build that IRA. It's time to build that 401k. It's building season in your marriage. You spent years chasing this and years chasing that. Now it's time to chase each other. It's building season. It's building season educationally. You've gone as far as you can go with this current level of education. It's, it's time to build that degree. It's building season in your place of employment. It doesn't mean that it's time to leave, but it's time to realize that your office is your mission field and start building for the kingdom where God has you employed. And it's building season. It's building season for your relationship with God. 
You're asking God for more, but, but, but are you trying to go deeper in your relationship with God? See, the thing about building season is that age doesn't matter. But you matter. It's not about what age you are. It's not about whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're seasoned, whether you're middle-aged. It's building season for all of us because age doesn't matter. There's something to build whatever season you're in. And when it's building season and your foundation of the rock is the rock, it doesn't matter about the uncertainties of life. It doesn't matter about the tension and stress that you deal with. When your foundation is the rock, you have security. When your foundation is the rock, you have stability. It was the rock that Jacob laid his head on and the heavens opened up. It was the rock that water flowed from and quenched the Israelites' thirst. It was the rock that Moses stood on and all of God's glory passed before him. The rock is our salvation. The rock is our fortress. The rock is our redeemer. The rock is our hiding place. The rock is our, is our strength. The rock is our escape. The rock is our habitation. The rock is everlasting. If you haven't caught on by now, the rock is Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about your Savior. There's no name above that name. There's no name that is sweeter than the name of Jesus. Jesus is your rock. Y'all know the song, Rock of Ages, clap for me. Help me find myself in thee. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the only true foundation. Jesus is the rock that will not be put to shame. Jesus is the rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Is there anybody in here that will give God some praise? Is there anybody in here that will glorify the rock of ages? Is there anybody in here that will worship Jesus for being your rock, for being your refuge, for being your high tower? It's building season. Will anybody give God some praise that he's letting you build again? You didn't get it right the first time, but you can do it again. You didn't get it right, but you got a second chance. The grace of God has brought it around again. It is building season. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. House of the Lord, it's building season. But here's the question. Here's the question. Will you choose the rock? Will you choose the rock? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the grace that chases us down. The grace that arrests us and gives us a second chance. Lord, I thank you that your word will accomplish what you have sent it forth to do. That it not, will not return to you void, but it will accomplish your purposes. Lord, I just ask for unusual favor in the life of everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, whoever I'm preaching to, if it's their building season, I just pray an, an unusual outpour of your anointing upon their lives to build. Whatever it is, Father, I ask that you will continue to walk with them and strengthen them to endure the work that it takes to build. Give them supernatural strength and endurance, Father. Lord, I just pray that you would allow this word to continue to preach in our hearts and in our minds that when the devil tries to come against us, when he, when he tries to steal this word from taking root, 
that he will have been too late and that it will already have a hold of our hearts. Lord, we thank you for what you've done during this preaching moment. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you, are viewing, <clears throat> if you are viewing this service online or if you're here today and you want to join the church, if you want to connect with us, the information for how to do so will be up on the screen. You can just text that number or call the church and we would love to connect with you. We would love to make you and welcome you, I should say, into our church family. It is now offering time, the time in our service where we worship the Lord with our tithes and with our offerings. Uh, the information for how to give is on the screen. I can't thank you enough for how grateful we are to your faithfulness to give during this time. The House of Lord, we have, we have done so much. We're involved in so much. I don't know if you guys are staying up with and following the different things that we're doing, but we are really being, in a lot of ways, the city's church during this season. And we are able to do that in a big way because of your faithfulness to give into what God is doing in this ministry. Let us make our confession. As we give today's offering, we proclaim on the base of a backer, I've got to yet praise. Therefore, in spite of social isolation, social injustice, economic collapse, sad circumstances, food shortages, the stock market, unemployment, the gasoline prices, the housing market, terrorism, Yet will I praise you. I will praise you with my manners, my mouth, and my material. I will praise you with my walk, my words, and my worship. I will praise you with my practices, my pronouncements, and a portion of my paycheck. I affirm this yet praise with the highest praise word. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for those that, that gave, and I thank you for those that were unable to give. I ask that you would bless them, that they may be able to participate in the near future. Lord, I ask that you would bring them back a hundredfold for what they've given into the ministry here. And Lord, I ask that you would bless us to be able to use it and multiply it so that we may be able to do and transact more kingdom business for your honor and for your glory. Lord, protect us, cover us until we're able to join again. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Have a blessed week.